You know me as an espresso guy. Every week we talk about espresso machines, but actually I love drip coffee. And I was always asking myself how to combine these two worlds. And I'm really happy that Scott is here because he invented something we can use at an espresso machine to make drip coffee. Let's talk about this now. Um, and I didn't show you this, but the basket has a lot of holes up here. Scott, I'm really happy that you are here, that we can talk about drip coffee, espresso. This is also something, actually, you are also love, living and loving both worlds, isn't it? Yes, yes, and thank you for having me here. Um, I have Filter coffee is my first love. Yeah. Of course, I come from America, where filter coffee has always been quite popular. Um, I like espresso, but uh, when it comes to expensive coffees and getting uh, all the fine flavors in coffee, I think filter coffee cannot be beat. And you kind of went the whole way. I think your first book was 2008. Mm -hmm. This is when I was starting in coffee, having my first coffee shops. Mm -hmm. This was about ex actually extraction, extraction and yeah. barista, isn't yeah, mostly it? Mostly espresso uh, related, a little bit about filter. It was called Professional Barista's Handbook. Yeah. Um, I started in 1994, had my first cafe and roastery. And then uh, after I had my second one, uh, I had some free time and I thought, you know, there really weren't many books for professional baristas and decided to do some research and then uh, write that book. And it was mostly for fun, uh, kind of a service. And then uh, I really enjoyed the process, so decided to write more books. And you have been always in data collection to understand things. Also, this was one of the baselines, I think, of your second or third book about roasting. Mm -hmm. You roasted with many roasters and you try to gather data to understand yes. what it's what is actually happening yes i mean of, of course historically coffee was always a craft yeah. and most coffee knowledge was handed down from a mentor or a teacher and i really like data i feel like uh, we know so little about coffee yeah and uh, the data isn't always easy to interpret but my feeling is that if we just collect a lot of data for years stay relatively agnostic uh, eventually the data starts teaching us things and, and often things that we don't expect or that we weren't looking for. So you roasted, you wrote that book about roasting and mm -hmm. you wrote a book about extraction? Yes, so I've got a book about making espresso or barista work, one about everything but espresso, which is the, the title. Um, and then I wrote two books about roasting. Um, I've done consulting for many years and at this point in my career I have roasted on uh, 700 different roasting machines. 700? Yes. And my goal in doing that really was, let's say you work on one roasting machine. Yeah. You might have a system that works really well for you, but mm -hmm. it's difficult to know which things you're doing are adapting to that machine or that coffee and which things are universally true for mm -hmm. coffee roasting in general. And once I started roasting on a few machines, I started realizing, okay, what I really want is experience on a variety of machines to understand what is just about the coffee roasting process and then what is about the individual machines. And I felt that if I did that, I would have a lot of uh, valuable knowledge over time. Now we are standing here with a decent espresso machine. Yes. And this is something that influenced your work, not only in drip coffee, but also in espresso the last years. So you got kind of a close, to con close connection to John. Mm -hmm. And it, this inspired also your work, I think. I yes. saw it in the articles you've wrote on your blog. And by the way, I'm linking all the books you've wrote and also your blog and also your new roastery down there. We will talk about the roastery Wonderful. later on. But how did it influence your work? I met John about nine years ago. Yeah. He hired me as a consultant, and but I thought the decent project was so cool that I wanted to be part of the company. And we talked a little bit about uh, collecting data and eventually letting the data teach us things. And what I loved about the Decent was that it's the first espresso machine that really gives you feedback about your shots and shows you a lot of data. And John and I didn't know exactly what we would do with the data or what it would mean, but we've spent the last eight years with the Decent uh, learning from it and it's really accelerated our understanding of espresso extraction mm. and I've also been uh, secretly working on trying to turn the Decent into a filter machine because filter is my first love and John has been supportive of that. Nice and I think we are getting there Yes, we are going to make a uh, filter coffee with a decent yes. espresso machine. I actually really love your impulse of gathering data. I, I told you when we had lunch today, this is actually also what we, was, what we are doing with the grinders. Mm -hmm. Collecting, we, in the beginning, we didn't know what we are actually collecting, but now we are getting there, understanding th th some numbers. And if I understand right, this is also kind of your way. Yeah, exactly. Collecting, trying to understand, yes. moving forward and putting it into something like yes. uh, 
yeah, filter device for an espresso machine. Yes, I, I see the data as I want to be what I would call agnostic about the data. I don't know what it's going to teach us. I don't know what the right data is, uh, but with enough time looking at it, certain things become apparent, patterns yeah. or, or teachings. So there have been three iterations of trying to make filter coffee on this machine. This is the third one. This is the third, and I think the final, I hope. Mm -hmm. So the first iteration was to make a Porta filter basket that was like a blank basket with a few holes in it that acted as a spray head. And you could put a Kalita or a V60 uh, underneath the spray head. And that worked okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the second iteration was a deep basket, like 25 grams, with 18 grams of coffee, ground very fine. Yeah. And because the Decent can control pressure quite well, it was made so that there was no pressure or up to about 0 0.1 bar of pressure. So it wasn't espresso. It, but it was made a little bit like an Americano in that you would have a very concentrated coffee and then dilute it to filter coffee strength. And that sometimes worked brilliantly, but it was dependent on having almost perfect puck prep. Yep. And that was too much to ask. It was too hard to do it. Uh, but funny enough, um, so, so with... It's with interesting the, that, that you say that because in espresso is everything about puck yes. press. In filter coffee, we never talked so much about puck right. press. Right. Um, with, with espresso, because it's so concentrated and because it has so much oils, the oils that coat your tongue mm -hmm. decrease your perception of bitterness mm -hmm. and astringency. So your puck prep may not be perfect in your espresso, but you won't necessarily sense all the bitterness and astringency. But when you spread the coffee and the oil out into a filter strength brew, you do sense the bitterness yeah. and astringency. So the bad puck prep in the filter 2.0 was very obvious. Funny enough, um, because decaf has no astringency or almost no astringency, that has become my go-to method for making decaf at home because you can get a very high extraction by making use of that tiny bit of pressure. Mm -hmm. And uh, decaf, since it creates a lot of fines when ground, clogs a lot of brewers yep. very easily. So this won't clog because mm -hmm. you can have a little bit of applied pressure. And I make filter decaf at about 24% extraction at home, which is mm -hmm. quite unusual and, and really yep. quite delicious. Yep. So the third iteration is this basket. The basket is about eight centimeters deep. Mm -hmm. It's got uh, lots of open hole area in yeah. the bottom. Big holes, yep. which I like because actually you are controlling the, yeah, the water flowing through by grind size, not so yeah. much by the holes. Eh? Exactly. And that would allow you to grind a little finer, get a little more extraction if you want it. Yeah. Right? There's a paper filter in the bottom, 57 yep. millimeters. And all we're going to do is put 22 grams, very coarse grind, like mm -hmm. a batch brew yep. coarse. We're going to shake it. That's the whole puck prep. Yep. <laughs> Just to level it. We're going to put it on the machine and the machine program will give us a bloom, a pre-wet and a bloom, and then several stages of uh, flow at very low flow. Also with the temperature dropping throughout the shot. Yeah, and this is where Decent comes to work. And this is also why it is working with Decent. And everyone more interested in the Decent espresso machine. We did a second video more um, talking about the Decent, the potential. But briefly, before we go into brewing, mm -hmm. why is the Decent the right machine to sure. make this coffee? So the Decent uh, can control pressure and flow and temperature, and you can create almost any program you can imagine with any combination of pressure and flow. You can switch from pressure profiling to flow profiling and back. You can even put limits so that, for instance, if you grind too fine and the pressure goes too high, the machine can say, oh, okay, I will limit the pressure so that the puck doesn't compress too much. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of control options. So for filter coffee, this might work in a few espresso machines that exist yeah, that have flow profiling. But there's always an issue. I just right. tested an espresso machine and you can then maybe set certain four or five pours, but you mm -hmm. cannot really precisely say go with one or two milliliters right. per second. Right. There are always limits. Huh? And that's it. Is that what's great about this is that we can go down to as low of a flow rate as, as we want. What is the lowest flow rate we can go? Uh, I suppose 0.1 milliliters per second yeah. could be accomplished. Oh. Um, and for the filter 2.0, the flow rate goes, out, the pre-wet is high, about uh, six milliliters per second. The rest of the pores are between one and two milliliters per second. Constantly. Yeah, so it's a, it's a very slow uh, and then slowly declining flow. And the idea is that we want the liquid level to be roughly in the middle yeah. of the basket. We don't want it to go too high because um, the more water column there is, the more pressure there is. And if there is any sort of micro channeling in there, you'll get slightly more astringency if there's more pressure. May I? Yeah, of course. What I noticed actually when I was looking at it, there are some holes mm. around there. 
Yes. I think this is really clever, mm-hmm. um, preventing it to create a vacuum inside. Eh? Exactly. But also overfilling. Yes. I think when you start with a grind size and maybe you don't know which grind size is yes. the perfect grind size, there's always an issue. And if the water is constantly flowing, or f- yeah, this yes. could be a. This is why we have the hose. Eh? Yes. So the holes allow it to breathe so that it'll keep flowing and like it won't create a vacuum like you say. And it's a little bit of an, uh, uh, if you grind too fine, rather than it just clogging up into the machine, you'll see a little bit of leakage and you'll say, oh, okay, I know I ground too fine here. We cannot see what's happening inside. Yes. Um, I guess not too much turbulences. Right. It's uh, because the flow rate is so low and the distance from the spray head to the grounds or the slurry is quite small, just a few centimeters, there's very little turbulence. It's a little bit like using a mellow drip for filter coffee. But because of the design, it's a no bypass brewer. So it's related to the trickleate or the next level in the sense that there's no way for the liquid to go around the filter and out. So you have no bypass and Mm -hmm. a little bypass is quite all right. But if you have a lot of bypass, of course, the coffee gets weaker, but also you might end up having a little extra astringency in the coffee. I'm really curious about the extraction per- percentage, which mm-hmm. we will achieve. Mm-hmm. I think we should brew a coffee. Sorry for the brief interruption. We've just launched a new English YouTube channel. The second part of this video will continue there. We'd be thrilled if you hop over and keep watching with us.